Well, good morning, everybody. How you doing? You doing okay? Y'all doing good? There you go. I'll tell you what, first service was jam-packed. I think some folks are headed to Mother's Day. Lunch is early, trying to beat you in line. That's all right. That's all right. Plenty of food. Y'all be good. I am so excited to be kicking off this brand new series entitled Reconciled, this journey through the book of Ephesians. And I think this is going to prove to be a landmark series where people remember what it is that God was doing in and through us. I love this book. I love this epistle. Now, do you all know what an epistle is? You know an epistle is not the wife of an apostle, right? <laughs> not the wife of an apostle. The epistle simply is a small letter, a short letter. And in this case, it's an epistle, a small letter written by the apostle Paul that was included in the Bible. There are 13 epistles in the New Testament written from Paul. And Ephesians has been called the queen of epistles. I don't know if all that's true. It is the queen to me. This is my favorite of all the epistles. There have been so many testimonies down through the years of why Ephesians has mattered to people. And there are lots of great stories. I think my favorite is a guy by the name of John Mackay. Mackay was the, went on to be the president of uh, Princeton Theological Seminary. And as he was that president, he tells a story from when he was a 14-year-old boy. And when he was 14, he, he's a Scottish dude, so this story will struggle to relate a little bit. Stick with me. He's a Scottish dude, and he's hiking through the highlands of Scotland, right? Okay, there, now it'll come back. But the highlands of Scotland. And as he was walking through the highlands, he was reading, as a 14-year-old, the book of Ephesians, which immediately tells you he is not the same kind of 14-year-old that I was, okay? This is a kid hiking through the highlands reading the Bible. He said as he read the book of Ephesians... It caught his heart so much that he actually gave his life to Christ right then and there just from the reading of this book. And he writes this as a 14-year-old in his journal. He says, after praying that prayer, I saw a brand new world. Everything was new. I had a new outlook. I had new experiences. I had a new attitude towards other people. I simply loved God. He says, Jesus Christ soon became the center of everything in my life. I was for the first time truly, really alive. To this book of Ephesians, I owe my life. Forty-five years later, this man who you, I suspect you don't know, and I doubt you care who the president of Princeton Theological Seminary was, but 45 years later, after that experience in Ephesians on the highlands of Scotland, he, was, he received an invitation to the University of Edinburgh to give some lectures. He chose to speak on Ephesians. And while speaking, he gave a line that became quite well-known and quite famous. He simply said this to the group at Edinburgh, Ephesians contains and distills the very essence of the Christian faith. The entirety of the Christian faith can be found in these six short chapters. I love the Bible, and I love the book of Ephesians. My prayer when we're done with this series is that you do too, that you do as well. And I think that can actually happen. Now listen, there's a lot of different ways to teach the Bible. You, you can teach the Bible uh, topically, um, like we did in the last series in the Company of Giants. It, you know, we had a week on, say, Esther. We're going to teach on Esther, so we go to her book, and you study the teachings and the scriptures around the person of Esther, and you write a sermon. You teach the Bible. Uh, that's called topical. Sometimes you teach textual messages, and that simply means, hey, what is Ephesians 2, 8, and 9? What do they mean? So you look up Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and you take the teaching of the sermon right from those verses. You can also teach expositorily, which means you kind of work through the words and the phrases and go verse by verse, and you teach it that way. I love teaching straight through a book of the Bible, and I love the fact that we're going to be teaching it all the way through this book, the book of Ephesians. Now, having said that, I have found through doing this for a while that there are two key parts to when teaching God's Word. Part one is the proclaiming of God's Word, the proclamation. That's my part. Meaning, I'm telling you in advance, I will have the proclamation part ready. 
I will study. I will labor over the text. I will pray for us. I'll pray over the scriptures. I, I, no matter what's going on in my day, I'll lose sleep. I'll cancel appointments. I do what I need to do to make sure that the teaching from God's word is ready so that we're ready to hear a word from God, okay? That's my, my promise. But, but the second part is on you. It's the receiving of God's truth. The receiving. And that's the part that only you could decide what you're going to do. And I don't frankly know where you are today. In fact, I never know really where anybody is. That's between you and God. Like you might be here and you might be completely disinterested in the teaching of God's word. Like you might not have any interest in it at all. Like you might be here because it's Mother's Day and your mom guilted you into coming to church. I'm glad to see you. But you might just be thinking, how long is this going to go? You, you might be in church and have been here for a long time but have really no interest. I just go to church because you're supposed to. My friends are there. It's what you do on Sundays. I go to church. And your interest level might not be high. Maybe you're, you're really interested. I don't know. But Jesus tells a parable called the parable of the sower. And he says there's a guy out there sowing seed. A farmer who's actually, and it's, it's a metaphor for teaching God's word like he's scattering seed. And he says, well, doing so, sometimes the teaching, the words of God, the teaching falls on various kinds of soil. Sometimes it falls on hard soil and nothing grows because the soil wasn't ready. This is about the receiving. It wasn't ready, didn't care. But sometimes it falls on fertile soil and it grows up and the word of God creates this this harvest which is massive and makes a difference forever. My prayer for you even for me, heading into this, for weeks on end has been that you are fertile soil. Like that you come here and you are interested in what God's word has to say. That's how I've been praying for you, that you'd come to the word of God hungry and you'd take in all you could. And I would like to kind of tell you why that matters through a verse to start our series that is not in the book of Ephesians. I'd like to bring you this verse from another letter of Paul, the letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, and it says this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's read that part with strength together, starting at, but be transformed. Ready? Let's do that part together. Ready? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's do that one again. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? Well, because then you'll know the will of God. You'll be able to test and approve what his will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you, and I'm eager for you, to be open to God's word and to be hungry for it because it matters for the very transformation of your life. Now, can I tell you something? Don't get mad at me, but I'm giving you this on Mother's Day, and it matters, so I'm going to kind of lay this out just real calm, okay? We all have thoughts and ideas, convictions, opinions, patterns, platforms. We have thoughts in our mind that are not in the renewed mind of Christ. Can I say that again? We all have thoughts in our mind, opinions, ideas, convictions that aren't from God at all. They're not biblical. I'm not saying they're evil. But they're not necessarily biblical. They're not from God's point of view. I have been in more discussions where more people have insisted and argued points of view that might have been true and might not have been true, but I've been able to look back and go, where in Scripture did you get that idea? And they'll go, well, you know, God gave me a mind, so I'm using it. And I'm going, awesome. You're arguing a thing about God that's not actually in God's word. That's not a position you want to be in. And I'm not saying these are evil thoughts, but what I am saying is they're just ideas that we have that you've run with forever. We do it as parents all the time. I'll tell you the best way to parent, and you're just freewheeling out there. Nothing to do with the God who is our original parent who invented parenting. But it's just your deal. I had a guy look me up and down and say, if you really love God, you will vote a certain way every single time. And I went, man, I hear you loud and clear. Where again is that in the Bible? Well, it's not in the Bible, but I'll tell you what, God's a God who, and then blah, 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 blah. Listen, I'm not against it. I'm simply saying whatever these ideas, concepts, convictions are that aren't biblical, if they're not in the mind of Christ, 
They are preventing you from becoming who God made you to be. They are taking up RAM in the computer of your brain that are not in the mind of Christ for you. And what he wants to do is renew your mind, thereby transforming your life. The thoughts we have that are of us and not of God, they prevent us. They slow us. They get in the way of us maturing, advancing, and transforming. We want the mind of Christ. Let me just tell you this. Can I kind of address everyone in the room who's under 25, but especially over here? Hey, guys, the younger you are, the better chance you have of hearing this one and getting it today. This gets older, uh, harder by the year. This one's harder. You've heard of old dogs? Never mind. You, you, listen, sometimes it's tougher the older you get, the longer you've had an idea. Easier the younger you are. Take this in. Because God wants to transform our lives by renewing the thoughts that are in our minds, especially the ones that aren't biblical that are keeping us from maturing. And here's a promise I can give you. Now, this is kind of cool, and this is straight from God's Word. If you will engage in this series, Reconciled, Journey Through Ephesians, if you'll engage in this series, you will be transformed Formed by the renewing of your mind as God gives you the mind of Christ. He will begin to change the way you think, which will change the way you live. How is this possible, you ask? It's simple because it's not your job or mine. We just need to be receptive. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit who works in you according to God's goal. Now, that's maybe never a phrase you've heard before, and I'm excited, and if you're a note-taker, you're going to want this, okay? Do you know what God's goal is for his word in your life? God's goal for his word in your life and in my life is that it would move from information to revelation. That it would move from just being information. Pastor, you got some good nuggets today. I need some information. Give me some new information. I never heard that fact. I never heard that detail. I never heard that verse. I never heard that perspective. I got some new information today. He wants it to go from information to revelation so that his truth can become your truth, my truth, our truth. Okay, so here's what I mean. Information's a good thing, but information's basically a neutral thing. Even if it's biblical information, it's not anything all that important until it goes from information to becoming revelation. Now, here's what revelation is. It's where the Holy Spirit turns on the light bulb in your heart and head and says, hold on a minute. This is not just a truth in my book. It's meant to be a truth in your life. There are things that we've heard all of our lives that are informational about the Bible and about the mind of God that we've just heard and said, amen. It's in the Bible. I'm for it. Woo. And it was nothing but words on a page. Nothing but words on a page. Powerless until the Holy Spirit brings life to it and transforms it and moves it from information to revelation. And how do you know it went from information to revelation? It begins to do something in your life. Revelation changes you. If you knew that God spoke to you, think about it like this. If God spoke to you audibly today and said something to you, and you knew it was a voice to the kind where you're looking around and you're going, is anybody else hearing this? I hear an audible voice and God gave you a word and you knew it was God. You know what? It would change the way you lived all the rest of your days. You'd never forget it. You would do it. You'd follow it. It would simply matter to you from now on because God himself said it to you. That's revelation. He speaks from his word and takes words and information and turns them into revelation. And it goes from being his truth to being your truth. That is God's goal for his word. That it doesn't just work in our head, but it works in our heads and our hearts, and there's a collision in the middle, and boom, it becomes revelation, and it begins to transform me by renewing my mind. God's goal for his word in your life. You want to know how the Holy Spirit helps that happen? It's by the way God made you. Can I tell you something that's true about you and true about me? Our lives head in the direction of our strongest thought. Your life goes in the direction 
of your strongest thought, good, bad, or otherwise. I remember talking to a guy not long ago who said to me, Pastor, I need your prayers. I said, I'm glad to pray for you. What's going on? He said, I might be losing my car and maybe my house, can't pay my bills. Our family's in some trouble. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is serious. Let's sit down. We start to talk. You know what he goes on to explain? That he lost his job. And I'm like, I feel so sorry. I'm so, how'd you lose your job? And he goes, well, I knew that God didn't want me in this job anymore, so I quit. I'm like, well, you quit for what other job? Well, no, I just know that God didn't want me in this job anymore, so I just quit. And I said, hold on, you, you, you didn't have an, a plan after that? I was just doing what I knew God wanted. He wanted me out of this crazy job. And I'm going, you didn't have a plan? You didn't have a fallback? God, when he was telling you to quit, didn't tell you what door he wanted you to step into? Haven't you ever read in the Bible that when God closes one door, he opens another? All right, not in the Bible. But the principle is certainly there. <clears throat> and I'm like, did you even have an idea? And he goes, no, I just knew that this wasn't a job for me. And I'm going, bro, you got this crazy thought in your head, you didn't pray it through, you didn't process it through, and now you might lose your car, making it real tough to go to the next job. What are you thinking? There are so many things we do. I remember meeting a family where they were really, really young, like 24, but they had like four kids under five. And I'm going, oh my gosh, you all must just love kids, right? And she's the mom's just going, yeah, we love kids. And I'm looking at the dude and he's going, no, 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 didn't want this. I'm like, bro, that's not a good response. He's like, yeah, dude. You know, she wanted more kids, and I just wanted a really good date night, and I didn't know what to do. So here we got some kids. I mean, I'm like, really? You didn't think this through? It just became the strongest idea. She wants kids, you want her, boom, we got a big family. Here's the idea. Your strongest thought is what leads your life. It's how we're built. It's how we're made. And for the next six weeks, starting next week, starting today, and then six more weeks, if you will dig in and engage in this series, in this book, the book of Ephesians, God is going to give you the opportunity to have your life transformed by renewing your mind in ways that you can't even believe. So I want to pray that you'll be fertile ground. So here's how I'd like to begin this series, as today is the introduction. I'd like you to take out your Bible. If that's a paper Bible... Cool, cool, cool. If it's an electronic Bible, go ahead and grab that. If you don't own a Bible, I bought cases of Bibles for you to take for free so that you can have a Bible, okay? You need the Word of God. Not just on your phone. You need a real, you need a, a tangible, physical one so you can get comfortable flipping around, seeing what's up, what's up. So I want you to get your Bible out right now. Everyone got it? And that's, if it's your phone, it's your phone. That's cool. You got it? I'd like you to put it in your hand and stand to your feet. We're going to pray and ask God to bless the teaching of his word in this series. Y'all up? Join me, everybody, please. Will you please join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for your word. I love the Bible. I love that you love us enough that you gave us your word in a way we can study it and learn your mind and learn who you are. Lord Jesus, open your word over the next Six weeks over the entire series of Reconcile, we're going to spend almost two months studying this little letter. Would you please help us be transformed by renewing our minds? Would you bless me as I prepare the proclamation of your word? Would you bless my church as we prepare to receive your word? Give us revelation and pour it into people who are fertile, who are hungry for your word. Change us, transform us, renew our minds so that we can live, move, and breathe with the mind of Christ. Open your word to us, we pray in Jesus' holy name. Everyone agreed and said? Amen, amen. Grab a seat. Open your Bibles. We are diving in. Get out your notes. The introduction is about to begin. As you find yourself learning the book of Ephesians, I want you to understand a few things. This letter was written by the Apostle Paul to a place called Ephesus and a church and the people of God who lived therein. I want you to get a picture in your mind of Ephesus so you don't forget it. Ephesus was the capital city and the primary port for Asia Minor. Here's a map you'll see. And you can see where you've got Ephesus there in the middle. And Ephesus is now where modern day Turkey is. 
and you can see it right there on the Mediterranean. You've got uh, Jerusalem down there to the south, east, and you can just take a look at this, and it's really, really beautiful uh, to get a picture of the ancient world. You know a lot of those cities from the Bible or from life, and some of them are still current today. Well, Ephesus wasn't just a little town like you'd think of in the first century. This was a massive, one of the largest and most important cities on the planet. It had a half a million people. Half a million people in the first century. It was a massive, massive city. It was the primary port for Asia Minor, and it's where all the trade routes converged in one place. So all three of the primary trade routes came through the port at Ephesus, so that's where the money was made. In fact, this was the financial capital of the richest region of the Roman Empire. In other words, you could go there to buy anything, to sell anything. It's where you went to make money. It's where you went to be around people. It's where you went to be around the who's who. Everybody would have been at Ephesus because this was one amazing place. You can go there today, you know. Now, Ephesus, the ancient city, is gone, but 25% of it has been uh, the subject of archaeological digs. So you can go there and walk on the actual streets. Right now you can walk on Main Street where Paul would have walked. And it's essentially little mosaics as you walk through and you just see the mosaic pattern. And as you walk down Main Street, uh, you'll pass things that are quite world famous that you can Google and learn lots about. You pass by a big two-story library called the Library of Celsus that was just a, a, a marker of history. There's the Odeon Theater that you can walk by where they held performances and political gatherings and things like that. And you can go see that. But if you walk by the Odeon Theater staying on Main Street, and when you get to the intersection at the end of Main Street and you make a right and you head toward the harbor, you will very quickly see something that you will not soon forget. You will see this. This is the Temple of Diana. The Temple of the Diana built to the Roman and Greek goddess Diana. Some of your translations will say Artemis. That is the same goddess. A goddess who is still worshipped to this very day. She's the goddess of the hunt, and she's the goddess of fertility, and she's the goddess of many things. And today, uh, the Wiccan uh, witches have covens to Diana. And this, this edifice built to her wasn't just some little building you walk by. In fact, it's four times the size of the Parthenon, if you've been to see the Parthenon. Four times. A, it sat 25,000 people, which is larger than the capacity of Rupp Arena in the largest basketball game crowd it ever has had. More people gather there to worship the Roman goddess Diana. In fact, this took 240 years to build, and it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They had quite the events there. And Diana was the center of much of their worship. Now, you got to understand why that's important. Because all the Greek and Roman gods would be worshipped in Ephesus. It was a big city. All the ethnicities, all the political points of view, everything converged in Ephesus. It was just a world city. And as you would go and see it to this day, you'd realize when you were looking at just 25%, this was a gargantuan city. Paul spent three years there primarily as a missionary. He spent three years there teaching about Jesus Christ, of whom they did not know. So Paul was bringing the new God on the scene, and he taught that Jesus was the one true God who will change your life. In fact, he went further, and many people were coming to faith in Christ. Lots of people were hearing Paul, and they were, they were dropping their pagan, what are called pagan or now neo-paganism. They were dropping it, and they were following Jesus. And there's a story in Acts chapter 19 and chapter 20 that talk about a silversmith and an event that happened there. The silversmith's name is Demetrius. And Demetrius seemed to kind of lead the trades of the area. And the way they made their money was to create icons and trinkets and images of Diana. But the more Paul preached, the less they were selling these little icons and trinkets and jewelry and standy uppies in your house. They were not selling them because people were abandoning Diana for Jesus because Paul openly taught that handmade gods are not gods at all. But Jesus died and rose again. And he'll change your life from the inside out. And people heard and people responded. When they did, Demetrius was getting a little upset because he was losing money. In fact, all of the trades that lived off of selling trinkets for pagan worship, they were all going broke. 
And they were all upset. And they were all getting mad. And Demetrius, it says there in Acts 19 and 20, pulled them all together and said, we've got to do something about this Jesus that Paul is preaching. We've got to drive them out. They filled the temple of Diana. And it says, for hours they chanted until a riot got going. Over and over and over the crowds chanted, great is Diana of Ephesus. Great is Diana of Ephesus. And it worked them up and they couldn't calm the 25,000 person crowd down. They brought in the mayor. They brought in politicians. They finally got them all simmered down. But even through the uproar, what they did was they drove the Christians and Paul out. Paul left Ephesus. He went to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, he did what Paul always does. Preaches Jesus, gets arrested. So he gets arrested. He's in a, it's quite a job. He's in the Roman prison there. And while in the Roman prison, he writes four letters, little letters called epistles. He writes the four prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. Ephesians was the first. And he writes this letter with six chapters. And he sends it back to the church he loves where he spent three years teaching, preaching, and pastoring. The book of Ephesians, by way of introduction, can be broken down into two sections. The first section is chapters 1 through 3, which is essentially all about God and what he has done for us in Christ. In Christ, get used to the phrase. The first three chapters, all he has done for us in Christ, you can call it the gospel story. Chapters 4, 5, and 6, the second half, is in response to 1, 2, and 3. How should we then live in response to all God has done for us in Christ? You can think of that as our story. The first half of the book, which we'll study in order, is God's story, the gospel story, and then our story, how we live in response. Now listen, you should understand this. Most of the epistles in the Bible were written because of some big problem. You realize that? Like Corinthians. Like all the different epistles were written in response to it, some heresy being taught, some wrong idea, some argument they were having, some difficulty, some problem with the church falling apart, people fighting, churches have troubles, they're made up of people like us, all messed up. So messed up stuff happens and Paul would write a letter. That's not the case with Ephesians. Paul didn't write to fix a problem at all. In fact, Paul wrote to help them simply grow in their faith. He knew that they'd be facing difficult times. He knew they'd be facing persecution and turmoil. He knew that they needed two things, God's word and each other, God's people. God's word and God's people because they were going to try and grow in a really tough environment. Can I just pause for a second and ask, are some of you trying to grow in a really tough environment? Like are some of you trying to grow in your faith under really difficult circumstances? Like maybe you're fo following hard after God, you've given your life to Christ, but your spouse does not know Jesus. <laughs> That's tough. Maybe you are somebody who you've given your life to Christ and you're trying to grow in your faith, but your family doesn't follow Christ. When I gave my life to Jesus, I remember going home so excited. I'd been in trouble so much and getting kicked out of school and in trouble with all sorts of stuff. I'm a 16-year-old kid, and I, and I get tricked into going to some event, and I give my life to Christ, and I feel alive and different for the first time. So I run home, and I get home, and I run inside, and I say, Mom and Dad, here's what I did. They weren't Christians. My dad looks at me and says, I give it two weeks, two weeks for this thing. He's laughing at me, my dad, tough dude, alcoholic dude, loved him to death, great guy, just wasn't buying it, man. He gave me grief for decades and decades. Tough environment. My mother was like, oh, honey, whatever makes you feel better. I mean, listen, I did not have an easy place to grow. Maybe you experienced that in your family. Or maybe you've got a job or a friend group or an addiction. Maybe you've got something that makes it tough for you to grow. You need two things. You need God's word. And you need God's church. You need God's people. Just what the Ephesians needed. And just for why Paul was writing them. That's what you need if you want to stand. And thrive. And be transformed. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to open now with that introductory, those introductory remarks. We're going to dive into the book of Ephesians. And today, prepare yourself, get ready. We are going to study 
two verses. Okay, here we go. Two verses is what we're going to look at. It's not much, but it will set up the rest of the entire book. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And it simply reads, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I've been teaching the Bible for over well over half my life. I have found that there are two questions that must be asked and answered in order to properly understand and then live out the scriptures. They are questions of identity. They are these following two questions. Number one, who is God? And number two, who am I? Who is God and who am I? And that's exactly where Paul starts this little letter. He starts right off at the fundamental part where you've got to be. And he says this, he says, I'm Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle. That's what I'm all about. That's who I am. That's what I'm about. Listening, friends, there's a consistent theme through the book of Ephesians about discovering your identity in Christ. And this matters. Discovering your identity in Christ. Get used to that phrase, in Christ. It's used 27 times in these six short chapters. 27 times. Because if you don't find your identity in Christ, you will find your identity in something that was never meant to tell you who you are. You will look for it in other people. You will look for it in what you own, where you shop, where you dress, what you drive, what you accomplish, what your trophies say, what the world says. You will not look for your identity in Christ. You will look for it in every other marker that has no authority to tell you who you are. Paul, knowing this, starts off telling us exactly who he is. I am Paul, chosen by the will of God. My role? To be an apostle. All for Jesus. So here's what I want to do. I want to help you start this off strong. And I want you to do me a favor. Ready for this little exercise? I want you thinking of the verse that I just read you three times. I want you to take out the name Paul. And I want you to take out, I don't mean from your Bible, I mean in your mind. And I want you to take out the word apostle. Where it said Paul, I want you to insert your name. I, Pete, and then I want you to finish and fill in the next blank. I, Pete, chosen by the will of God to be a pastor and an ambassador for Jesus. I want you to put in your name and what it is you do. I want you to take out your name and put in what you do. I want you to say, I, Cynthia, I, Bob, I, Heather, I, Bethany, I, Fill in your name, and then I want you thinking it through with whatever it is you do. I am a teacher, chosen by God, chosen by the will of God, to be a teacher for Christ, to be a nurse for Christ, to be an engineer for Christ, to be a secretary for Christ, to be a student for Christ. Whatever it is you do, that matters less. What matters more is that you recognize who you are in Christ, that he chose you for something to do, and what you do is less important than who you are doing it for. Does that make sense? So what is your name? Put it in the sentence. I, Pete, chosen by the will of God to be a pastor and ambassador for Christ. What is your calling? Now, here's why I want you getting this one set up to begin with, to start our journey into this book. Every single one of us has a ministry, from the youngest to the oldest. Right now, every one of us has a ministry. Now listen, if you're thinking, you know, I don't even know what that is, there's a good chance you're not doing that ministry. There's a chance you don't know it, or you're doing it, you don't realize that you're doing it. So let's unpack that a little bit. You are somebody, and you need to understand this because I want to convince you, because I know in a group this size, there's some of us who not only don't know that we have a ministry, but we kind of think we're just a random going through life person who kind of just ended up here. Like you think you're an accident or you think you're just random or you just think that you are the product of whatever. But the simple fact is there's more to it than that. God created you on purpose. And he created you 
for a purpose. Are you hearing me? God created you on purpose, and he created you for a purpose. You're not an accident, so I ask you the question, digging in just a little deeper, do you know who you are in Christ? Paul does, and he makes it real clear, and he sets the path in the right direction as we dive into this letter. He knows both of those answers to those questions. Who is God? The Father, he writes, who chooses us by his will, who chooses us by his will, and he is the source who gives us grace and peace. We just took that from those two verses. The Father is the one who chooses you and the one who is the source that gives you grace and gives you peace. You, you, you need more peace in your life? Is anxiety or depression or discouragement winning the day? Is your marriage too much? Are the people in your life just too extra? Is there too much confusion about the future? Are you losing sleep? Paul says, I'm a son of the Father who gives peace to fill our mind and our hearts in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I know who God is and I know who I am. You want to know who I am? I'm a follower, I'm a servant. And God has set me up to be a son who is the recipient of grace and peace. Paul knows who God is and he knows who he is. Do you know who you are in Christ Jesus? Is it clear to you? There's a reason Paul starts in the very first few words of this letter. Basically, if you had to summarize it and write your own uh, uh, message version, you could write it this way. Paul, hey, listen, the most important thing y'all need to know about me who's writing this letter to y'all is this. I'm a servant of God, chosen by God, son of God, and he's the father who fills me with grace and peace, and he tells me where to serve Jesus. It's just that clear in his mind, and it's just that unmistakable for him. And I don't want you to miss this, and I wish I could dive into this one further, and I can't. But here's a line I'll give you to chew on. Maybe take it to your life group. The way you perceive somebody affects the way you receive somebody. The way you perceive somebody affects and impacts the way you receive somebody. H have you ever met somebody famous and you knew you were about to meet a famous person? Or maybe you went to a concert and you were thinking about paying the extra money for the meet and greet and like you're going to go ahead and, and you're going to pay the extra money and you're going to pay 150 bucks to go ahead and meet this person. I just heard of a sporting event that's coming up in July where you can buy a $2 million front row seat and you also get a meet and greet with the people who are fighting. And I'll just leave it that for you to figure out. $2 million because you really want to meet that person. You know what? You would not consider buying the ticket for the meet and greet for a band that you've never heard of. Just because somebody next to you says, hey, we're going to go here this one day, you ought to come, we're going to buy the early expensive meet and greet tickets, you're like, not a chance. I don't even know one song by them. If they're your favorite group, you might think about it. The way you perceive them affects the way you receive them. And here's why I tell you all that. It's the truth for you too. The way you perceive yourself affects the way you receive and respond to you. If you look in the mirror, my friend, and you think to yourself, of the letdown that you are, the disappointment you are to your parents, to yourself, the way you didn't accomplish what your sister did or what your brother did, the way you haven't reached your goals, like your life arrived at this, this is where my life is, really, how did I end up here? If you look in the mirror thinking of all the ways you have not measured up as a mom, as a dad, if that's who you see in the mirror, you will treat yourself like that failure. You will treat yourself like everything you never became. But, on the flip side, if you look in the mirror, and despite the reality of your life, if you're able to look in the mirror and you can say, I'm a dearly loved child of the Most High God. I was an orphan and then... God took me in and made me his own. He adopted me into his family. 
I wasn't measuring up in other ways, but, but then God swooped down and he changed my life. I was struggling. I was failing. I was not measuring up to what everybody wanted to see from me, but God made something and made me his own. I'm a dearly loved son or a dearly loved daughter. God has highly prized me in heavenly places. He loves me and I belong to him. He calls me beautiful. He calls me redeemed. He calls me new. He calls me rescued. He calls me his own. If that's who you see in the mirror, you will treat yourself like someone that God has declared to be priceless. The way you receive somebody is directly related to how you perceive them. And Paul kicks this thing off saying, you want to know who this letter is from? It's from God, but it's through me. You want to know who I am? I'm chosen by the will of God to be an apostle for Jesus. I'm a son who receives grace and peace from the Father. The reason I called this series Reconciled is because that's the truth of what the gospel is about. Do you realize the book of Ephesians from opening to closing word is about the grace that we find in Christ and the peace that results? That's the opening verse and that's the closing verse. The book of Ephesians is about how we can be reconciled to God vertically. You have not lost God. God is not done with you. God is not finished with you. He's waiting to reconcile you because he says no to nobody. He says yes to everyone. That's the truth of that reconciliation. But on this day, I want to talk also about this reconciliation horizontally. There are probably some people in your life where it hasn't gone like you would have hoped. Maybe it's with somebody in your actual crew, like a son or a daughter or a parent. Do, do, do you know that he is also, in Ephesians, the, the God who reconciles horizontally? He's the God who reconciles us to people we think that uh, Never that maybe we need to trust them again or be in close connection again, but he reconciles us to each other. He reconciles us, and that's why the scriptures talk about there's no more male and female where you've got to be against one another. There's, there's no more black and white where you have to be against each other. There's no more Gentile and Jew where you have to be against each other. I have torn down the wall that separates you, and I've made you one family. I've reconciled what the devil tried to destroy by dividing. He is the God who reconciles. And I am hoping and praying that in this series, you will realize who you are in Christ such that you can find yourself free to become who God has made you to be. I conclude with this story that helps open up the book for the rest of the series. I was at Lowe's. The other day, I had just gotten done moving, or at least I'm not sure you're ever done. We're nowhere near done. I take it all back. We have just begun moving. Thank you to all of you who showed up to help us. We have most of our junk under one roof. And we have now moved into a home, which is awesome. Thanks for those of you who prayed. Thanks for everyone who helped. Um, I was going to Lowe's to buy something. We needed to fix something, 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 something. All right, so I'm at Lowe's, and I'm buying some nuts and bolts. And as I'm leaving, I'm going to my car. This was just the other day, probably 6 o'clock at night. And I hear... A woman's voice that I don't recognize. And she hollers across the parking lot. And I hear these words, Pastor Pete, I need your help. And I kind of look over and I see a woman getting out of her car. Well, she had bags in her hand, so obviously she had already been to Lowe's and was leaving. And then sees me and, and gets back out of her car and yells and comes over. I show my interest. She comes this way. I don't know who she is. I assume she's a one-lifer. I, I, it's hard to know. Um, I say, what's going on? And essentially she says this, I am not doing well. I am not uh, doing great at all. My life's been really hard. I'm an addict. I lost my parents to drugs when I was little. I got clean for a bunch of years when I went to jail. And when I got back out, all the prayers for the life I longed for, God answered. And I began to live this life that I never dreamed I could live. It was just going great. And then I met another person and they were clean and I was clean and we were doing great and then we kind of led each other in the wrong direction and before long we both relapsed. Since then they've gone off to jail. 
I've begun using, my life's broken, I've lost my family, I've lost my kids. This was a sharp lady. She said, my life is a wreck and I just need prayer. I empathized and said, I'm sorry, and that sounds grueling, I'm sorry to hear that. We began to talk. It came around in our discussion where I finally asked her this question. I said to her, have you ever just come before God and confessed your need for him? And she's like, yeah, I need his help all the time. I said, no, no, not that. Everyone knows what it means to be in trouble and call out to God. That's not what I mean. I mean, have you ever surrendered your life to Christ, acknowledged your need for forgiveness and for all the bad decisions and the hurt you've caused to yourself and others, and asked him to forgive you and redeem you? Have you asked him to make reconciliation happen between you and he and the rest of people in your life? Have you asked for the reconciliation that only comes from God? And she looked at me with eyes wide and she said, no. Are you kidding me? I didn't even know that was a thing. That's what I need in my life. I need to be reconciled to God. I need to be redeemed for this crazy life I've lived. How do you even do that? And I said, I can help you with that right now. And we bowed in that parking lot and she prayed, dear God, forgive me of my choices. Forgive my sins. Wash me clean. Make me new. Help me to trust you and follow you. I give you my life. Redeem me, forgive me, and make me yours. We said amen. She gives me this hug like she is getting paid by the rib she breaks. I mean, I mean this, she is squeezing so hard. I'm like, this is great. And then the Holy Spirit just gives me a clear leading, and I kind of take it. And I'm like, hold on, hold on, stand back for a second. And I look at her and I say, did you mean what you just prayed. I, I mean, I know you're in trouble. You need help. You called out to a stranger in a parking lot. Yeah, I got that. But did you mean it? She said, every word. I said, did you surrender your life and put your trust in Christ that you want to learn about him and follow him and, and put your faith in him because you know that you can't lead your life, but he can? She said, I meant it from the bottom of my heart. I said, that's amazing. That's great because God turns down nobody. He said, yes, you, you belong to him now. And she said, I know. I feel amazing. And I said, therefore, let's do this. And she said, what? Because she was way down here. Everything in her life had gone bad. And she contributed to a lot of it. So at this point, I knew God wanted to redeem something important. And I said, all right, and I put my hands on her shoulders, and I said this. I said, I want you to say some truth statements from Scripture about who you are as a reconciled human being. And she said, I'll say what you want. I said, think about these words, and I want you to say them. They're from Scripture. She said, all right, let's go. And I said, say this out loud to God, and let your own ears hear your mouth saying it. I am a dearly loved daughter of the Most High God. And she said, I'm a dearly loved daughter of the Most High God. This is coming from a person with no family. I'm a dearly loved daughter of the Most High God. She says it. I say, I am redeemed of all my sins and of all my evil choices. She said, I am redeemed. I am washed. I am cleansed of all my sins and my evil choices. And then I said, this is what the scripture says. Say, I am forgiven. She goes, I am forgiven. I am rescued. I am rescued. I am pure. And she goes, I am. She goes, I am pure. And she just loses it. She goes, and then she does this. She goes, I'm pure. I'm, I'm pure. I am pure. I am pure. I am pure because of the blood of Christ. I am pure because of what he did on the cross. I am pure because he chooses me and by the will of God makes me his daughter. I am pure and a daughter of God. And she finished by saying, I'm not an orphan anymore. I belong to God now. And I am celebrating with her. And I want to leave you with that exact thought because here's the simple truth that you need to understand for Ephesians to make sense. You need to understand who you are on the cross of Jesus Christ. He suffered a horrible death, and he died, right? God treated Jesus on the cross like you and I deserve because of our sins so that he could then look and treat us as only Jesus deserves, pure and innocent and righteous. You are a saint 
of God, not because you're perfect, not because you're holy all the time, but because the blood of Christ declares it to be true. That's who you are. I, Pete, a, a chosen man of God by the will of God, an apostle sent, Paul says, I'm a preacher and you're a son and you're a daughter and a secretary and an engineer and a student and a mom and a dad for the cause and for the name of Jesus Christ. He declares you reconciled and redeemed when you put your trust in him and you belong to God now. That's the point of your life. That's who you are. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. Here's your action step for the week. I want you, every, every day this week, to read a chapter of Ephesians. I'd like, there are six chapters. If you start tomorrow, you'll read. And by Sunday, when we gather together next week to dive into, further into chapter one, you will have read the entire book, and it will begin to go from being information to being revelation. And it will begin to change and transform your mind, your heart, your life, your actions from the in side out. Jesus Christ, we come before you, chosen by the will of God, sons and daughters of the Most High God, forgiven and redeemed, reconciled with heaven, because we have been made new. We have been washed. We have been made pure in Christ. Meet us in this study, and may this journey transform us and may it not just be information but revelation that changes the way we think and live and act because we are taking on the mind of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.